Hey everyone, we're on the road again, and uh, I've got the MR2 Spider behind me with the 2AR FXE based motor build, and uh, let's go see how much power it makes. So we're going to do this in the pretty standard format for me. Um, I don't want to keep you guys waiting, so we're going to get right to the dyno. And then after that, uh, there'll be an in-depth uh, technical explanation about the results from today. And hopefully you want to stick around for that. But if you just want to see the dyno, let's get right to it. Let's get our first pull. Let's see what happens. We're up to temperature. before and after. The tune was pretty close already. All right, so it's the, uh, wow, look at this guys, hold on. Look at this cloud structure. Look at that over there. Isn't that neat? No, I don't know what kind of cloud that is, but uh, I feel that I'm in for some rain. I am going to go ahead and I'm going to keep driving. There's no way you guys are going to hear me clearly over all this rain. So, let's go to the shop. Alright, we're in the shop. So, let's just get to the results. Um, right here is what the car got on the dyno. And, in fact, let's tweak that a little bit. Since the MR2 Spider community seems to prefer talking about crank horsepower instead of wheel horsepower, we're going to apply a 13% correction. And this is what we got. Now, the reason for the 13%, um, I did a little bit of looking. I went with what Toyota advertises on the 2AR in the Scion TC platform with the exact same transmission I'm using in here and looked at what people got for dynos in stock applications and the difference there tended to be just about 13%. So that makes me feel good that that 13% is accurate, at least at these kinds of power levels. So here we are. What we got is 260 horsepower. Now, there's really only one bad thing about that, and that's that I was wrong. Um, this number is great in ways that we'll get to in a second, but I was never intending to bait you guys. Um, I sincerely believed that we could get to 280 horsepower, and we're going to show some graphs that show that there might be something afoot here in a second. But regardless, 260 is what we got. Um, and you'll notice that torque curve there looks a lot flatter than it did before. So this is overall, considering considering how cheap this engine is, it, it's, it's a pretty amazing result. And then I also ran it with the exhaust cam fixed at 20 degrees, um, 20 degrees advanced from where we had it set to. So that would be one more tooth advanced. And you can see here the dotted line and and the solid line is what I had before. The dotted line is now with that exhaust at a fixed position. So, so if you still use that Atkinson intake cam, but you put the fixed exhaust cam gear on it and you advance it by 20 degrees over the, yeah, we'll have to get into exactly what that means for the uh, teeth marking there, but that's the power. What you're gonna get there is that dotted line versus the solid line, which is what you get with uh, double VVTi. So yeah, twin VVTi actually does add a fair bit of power and it's, it's just generally nice. Now let's frame that data a bit further. Let's take a look at this. And right here, we've added the dyno graph from what we got with the 1AR with the custom reground cams. So this engine build is a lot more complicated uh, because I had to get custom grinds made. And 
because of that, right, I spent $1,000 in cams instead of $300 in cams. So a fair bit more expensive build, but it made more power. Now there's something suspicious there, like right at the end, uh, you can see how both lines converge. That kind of implies that there's a limitation somewhere else in the motor, but again, just wait for the analysis further in the video, more details on that. And for perspective, uh, let's put the uh, 245 horsepower K24 build that everybody tends to use as a benchmark in this community, and we get this. So if you look at that, like this 260 horsepower build, it's got more power through the whole range, and it's cheaper to build. So um, the only downside you can say about this thing is the transmission's a little hard to get, but frankly, if you get the transmission brand new at the dealer, while it is a bit of sticker shock, it still ends up being about the same price or slightly cheaper for this build. And you get an extra 15 horsepower at peak and a lot more power across the rest of the range. And the other graph that I really wanted to put here, but I couldn't find, uh, Four Pistons Racing has a, their, their cheapest offering is a 340 horsepower K24 with, uh, it ends up costing, I think it's about $9,600. I wanted to put that on here to compare, you know, because that's a higher power K24, right? Because they can make more power. But I wanted to compare what a $9,000 build versus a $1,000 build and show you kind of what the difference there is. So, and unfortunately, I just wasn't able to find that dyno. If you can find it, please email it to me. Um, and there's a good chance we'll talk about it in a future video with both of them overlapped. Because I think it's a valid comparison. So let's get to the deeper technical discussion. Um, let's get to why this engine made less power than expected by 20 horsepower. That's not an insignificant amount. Um, and the best way to do that, so we changed a couple variables, but we have data to be able to somewhat eliminate some of these variables. And one of the graphs I wanna show here is torque from air quantity. So with a fixed amount of air at a certain RPM, how much torque are you making? And in this case, it's foot pounds of torque per milligram of air but just look at the graph as an efficiency graph. It doesn't really matter what the units are, it's just the column here on the left would be slightly different if we used uh, Newton meters per, well actually we are using metric, right, per gram. Uh, whatever you wanna pick, it doesn't matter. This axis truly doesn't mean anything. Just look at it as an efficiency number. The first thing you see from this graph is right at 6,000, the lines diverge and what's happening there is the new motor is a lot more efficient for each unit of air that it takes in, it makes more power to the ground. And we're using torque instead of horsepower to basically take RPM out of the equation. If we look at this, this is exactly the result I was expecting. So if the piston was indeed running away from the flame front, this is what we'd see is the efficiency of that motor with the lower compression ratio would just drop at higher RPM. And in this case, it sustains it longer. Now you can see it does start dropping towards the end and I mean, at high RPM, there's always going to be losses. Does that mean that we can't make it better? No, there's probably things that can be done to make it better. But this is a huge win, right? So this motor is definitely keeper. But if we look at the stuff before 6,000, there's something disturbing there. So what we're seeing is for the same amount of air, this motor is making the same as the previous one, which is, well, it's right up there. That's why I keep pointing that way. Um, and that doesn't make sense because the other motor was 10.0 to one compression ratio. This is 12.5 to one compression ratio. So it should make more power. It's debatable exactly how much more power it should make based on the air. You know, there's numbers out there from two, three, four, five percent more per point of compression. And in this case, we have two and a half points of compression. We should be seeing eight to 10% more. And why aren't we seeing it? I, I don't know. I actually, um, I even went out and bought a leak tester and I tested this motor and we're about 2% leak down on all cylinders. Like that's a really healthy motor. You can't ask for more than that. Uh, I don't know. The, the one thing that I wonder is, is it possible that Toyota's rating of this guy, because this is an Atkinson motor, it, it's not an Atkinson anymore, but it started as an Atkinson motor. Are they considering the compression ratio? Are they calculating it differently versus the other one? So maybe there's not as much of a change in compression ratio, but then we're seeing that efficiency at the top end. So I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and say I'm confused here. Um, I think based on this graph, we should have seen our 280 horsepower, but the dyno proves that we didn't. So something needs to change to get there. 
The next graph we can see here is volumetric efficiency. Now, this graph's a little bit rough, and for volumetric efficiency's sake, it doesn't make sense, so let's smooth that data out, and we get this graph. So if we look at this volumetric efficiency, this essentially isolates what our cams are doing. And we can see our previous cams were actually, they're still above 100% volumetric efficiency. They're still above 100% volumetric efficiency at the top, and that means they've got a lot more RPM to go, right? That's, that's great. Um, if we look at these Atkinson cams that we used, they were a little bit smaller. Uh, the advertised duration would be about 15 degrees smaller. Um, the duration at 50 thousandths lift is about eight degrees smaller. So they're not that much smaller. Uh, now there is a lot less lift. This guy here only has 10.3 millimeters of lift. Sorry, nine, 9 point two. Well, here's a graph you can see right here. This is the difference between the camshafts. Um, I showed this graph last time when I was assembling the motor, but you can see there's almost a millimeter difference between the, the lift there between the cam. So that'll make a big difference. And if you look here, look back at the volumetric efficiency, you can see the Atkinson cams do start to drop off. Now they're doing really well. They're still almost at 100% when we're hitting, you know, 70, 400 RPM or so. So I'm really happy with these cams. These cams are a huge bargain for what they are. They, they're definitely delivering on that. And think about it, right? We took that hybrid motor, which was rated at 154 horsepower and using one more part from the exact same parts bin, we added 100 horsepower to it. Actually, a little more than 100 horsepower. So these cams are great, um, especially when you consider they're $300 brand new at the dealer. So huge find, very happy about that. But there's definitely something to be said for an even bigger cam. Now, one thing to talk about for the smaller cam is this thing actually idles really nicely. Those 1AR cams I had, they wouldn't idle worth a damn below about 1100 rpm and even then the idle was pretty weak so if you weren't super careful the engine would stall this thing um, i've currently got the idle set to 800 rpm but it could very easily go down to the 650 that this thing normally runs and it still has a, a nice strong you know in first gear you can take off from a light without using the accelerator and it it just drives like a much more normal motor so I think these cams are going to end up being something good for a lot of people between their price and their down low torque. But of course, if our goal is to get into the 300 horsepower range, then we're, we're definitely going to need to go to a bigger cam. Uh, there's, there's, to get, there's going to be more of that coming soon. So then if we go back and look at that first graph here with the 1AR versus the 2AR, and uh, we can see the lines converge there at the end but they're not really converging. So that convergence would imply that there's a limitation somewhere else in the system, like the intake is running out of flow or the exhaust is running out of flow or both, of course. But in this case, we can see the fact that they're converging is really just a coincidence because this motor is being a lot more efficient. So it's dropping less, but it's actually still using a lot less air. So if this thing was taking in the air that the 1AR was taking, um, it would be making significantly more power at that point. It would have crossed somewhere around 6,000 RPM, the 2AR FXC, but with the bigger reground cams would have just kept going way past what the 1AR with the reground cams did. Another thing to note is I was running this motor to 7,600 RPM because if you remember, if, well, here, actually, if we look at that cam curve again, you can see the top, which is where the, the valve spring pressure matters. The top is a lot smoother on these cams, so I figured it's probably going to be safe for higher RPM. Now, is a couple days worth of abuse on the street and like 30 some odd pulls on the dyno enough to really prove that? Absolutely not, it, it's not, but it's good enough for me and I'm going to take this thing to the racetrack and I'm gonna leave it at 7,600 RPM and we'll see what happens. If I spit out a rocker, I won't be thrilled, but I'll be happy to have the data. I'd rather be able to tell you guys that, hey, you know, for 10 hours in a row, full throttle, this thing had no problems. At that point, I'll feel confident saying 7,600 RPM is definitely a good limit. It might even be higher, but 7,600 is safe. Or I'll come back and announce that it wasn't safe and we should probably stick to that 72 or maybe even 7,400 or so. It's a, it's a square relationship, so just a couple hundred RPMs makes a big difference. And something else I wanted to mention is without balance shafts on this motor, I really can't, I, I can't feel it. The motor doesn't seem to be revving faster 
and the motor doesn't seem to be vibrating anymore. If I hadn't personally removed the balance shafts from this motor, I wouldn't, wouldn't know it. Um, if we had done that as an individual test, if we had just removed that and changed no other variables on the motor, then maybe we would have seen some gains. I'm not 100% sure how to isolate those gains. I can't think of any data that I have logged that would let me be able to do that. So unfortunately, that's just something we're gonna find out later. Now, personally, I don't plan on putting balance shafts in the motor. If nothing else, it takes eight and a half pounds off of the car and on a 2000 pound car, that's a pretty significant weight gain. I would never turn down an eight and a half pound weight loss. So um, yeah, for me, no more balance shafts. And if that ever becomes a problem, you guys will be the first ones to know. So in conclusion, right, if we look back at this dyno graph with both of them on there, I really do think that this was an unmitigated success. Uh, I didn't hit the numbers that I wanted to, but I'm super happy with it. And in fact, let's put the K series back on there. You know, I think the people that are looking for cheap power, I, I think it's here. I think this ends up being a, a pretty simple engine build. Now, that K24 on there, that is just an intake and exhaust replacement. In this case, we're not replacing the intake. We're still using the 2AR stock intake, uh, but we are replacing a cam. So, you know, does that $300 cam cost more than the intake you have to use on the K24? I actually don't know, but a $300 cam, I would expect is probably about the same range. It's just a little bit harder to swap. But if you look a couple videos back, in fact, if you look there, that's gonna be the video where I assembled this motor. You can see it really wasn't bad to do. Another thing I wanna address that's actually not power related is the cam gear rattle on this motor. In my opinion, that's really the only weak point for this motor. And that ends up being if you're running some heavier oil than factory, which in this case I am running, uh, right now I've got 5W20 in here instead of the 0W20 that it calls for. And it pretty much always rattles that startup, which is frustrating. And the one error that I had done always rattles that startup. And I thought the cam gears were gonna be damaged. I went ahead and took the 1AR cam gears apart and found that there actually was no damage in there. And more importantly, I figured out how to solve the problem. So I still have a bit more investigation to do there and probably uh, some custom parts to get made, but I should be able to sell a solution for the cam gear rattle for about $20, $25 here shortly, within a matter of weeks. Um, of course, I'll wanna test it. Actually, yeah, it won't be for sale. I'll, I'll have parts in a matter of weeks, but I wanna actually test it on one of my motors before I sell it to the general public. But I really think that uh, the days of needing to throw $600 with phasers at these motors to solve this rattle is gone. So that should be really good for people out there and should encourage people to do more and more high power builds on these things. So that's, uh, that's all I got. You guys have a great day and thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Bye.